Well, good morning, Lake Sawyer. Hey, will you stand on your feet and worship with us? Uh, we're excited this morning. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. It's I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. You pick me up, you turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I think the master, I think the same. We say, I thank God. Hey, you're not denied what I do. No choice but to believe. My doubts are burning. My gosh, is burning. So long to my old Burden and bitterness, you can't just keep it moving. Now you ain't welcome here. Now till I walk the streets of gold, I think of how you saved my soul. The wayward son has found his way back home. You pick me up, you turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior, I thank God. Oh, I thank God. That's another one. I love this song. He picked me up. He turned me around. He placed my feet on solid ground because he healed my heart. He changed my name forever free. I'm not the same. My name is Jennifer, and I love that song because that's my story, and I pray that that's your story too. We are chasing after Jesus here this morning, and the cool thing is that life is messy, but God is not. And so I'm really glad you're here this morning. So if it's your first time with us, we have a couple of ways for you to get to know us a little bit. We'd love to get to know you. Um, but the first thing you can do is there's a QR code on that seat back in front of you. If you scan it, pull it up, there's a program in there. It's going to tell you a little bit more about Lake Sawyer. There's a connect card at the bottom. We'd love it for you to fill that out just to say hey and let us know you're here so that we can welcome you. We want to make sure you feel welcome here at Lake Sawyer because you are. And the other piece is there's something called Five and Five that we're going to talk about at the end of the service. So listen up for that if you're new. And meanwhile, we 
we want to say welcome to you if it's your first time. If it's not your first time, I want to encourage you to find someone you don't know today and introduce yourself. Let's keep singing together. Welcome to Lake Sawyer.
crucified all my sin and shame it was washed by your mercy you are the treasure I find a reason for living so live my life become an offering to the one who is worthy come on all over this place all praise Oh, praise to the Lord Most High. Oh, praise to the one who saved my life. Oh, praise to Jesus Christ, High King of Heaven, my King forever.
Father, we lift our high praise to you, our high king, the one who saved our lives. Just as we celebrated a few weeks ago at Easter, Father, we lift our praise, our worship, our words to you. Father, we're grateful. Father, we thank you. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, you can have a seat this morning. As we sit in this moment, we get the opportunity this morning to take communion together. Like I said a couple seconds ago, we celebrated Easter a few weeks ago, right? The death and resurrection of Jesus and communion is a reminder of that. See, we take the juice, the blood, and the cracker that represents his body that was broken for you and for me, the greatest act of love and kindness. So this morning we get to do so together. If you walked in and you didn't get a communion cup, if you throw your hand up, we have a great team who would love to make sure that you get one. We're gonna take a couple seconds and just pause. Take communion as you feel. There'll be some scripture on the screen behind me and I'll come back and we'll pray together. broken, your blood that was shed, Father, for the greatest gift of love and kindness. Father, we're thankful. God, would we do this, God, in remembrance. Father, we lift our praise and our worship to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We talk about this a lot here as a church. We believe uh, that summer changes everything, that we believe it has the power and potential to change everything for one of our kids or our middle schoolers or high schoolers, that there is, a, uh, there is something to be said about getting kids together intentionally over a week to build relationships with one another, to build relationships with their leader, but most importantly, to hear the message of Jesus. It has the power and potential to change the trajectory of a kid's life. And so we encourage and we create space, and not only do we create space and encourage, but as a church, we put resources towards making camps accessible to everyone. If you're with us late last year, you know that we, we sold some merchandise. All of that went to buy down the cost of camps. Uh, we also, just because of the ongoing generosity of our church, we have the ability to reduce the cost of camps. Literally, camps this year for middle school and high school are hundreds of dollars less than they actually cost, and we're able to do that because of your generosity. And because of that, we are able to ensure that anyone who has a desire to get to camp is able to go to camp. And one of those places, one of those camps that we're really passionate about is Mega Sports Camp. This is our camp for kids age four all the way up to fifth grade, and it is based around sports. Kids love sports. As adults, a lot of us love sports. And so we use sports as a mechanism to be able to share the hope and the love of Jesus. And so there's going to be some fun sports. There's going to be basketball and 
and soccer and volleyball and cheer. We're actually going to have football for the first time this year and more. And so we want to make sure you know about that because if you have a kid uh, that's four to fifth grade or a grandkid that's four to fifth grade, we want to encourage you to sign them up for them to invite their friends to, to sign up and to be a part of Mega Sports Camp. For more information or details, you can look inside the program that's accessible to see back QR code in front of you. And I want to make sure you know that there is an early bird deadline for early bird pricing, so make sure you sign up. Spots do fill up for Mega Sports Camp. We look forward to seeing you there and your kiddos there being a part of an amazing week. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, we are uh, continuing in our series more than a children's story. And throughout this series, we're going to be looking at these classic Old Testament stories, stories that many of you know and love. And that's probably true whether or not you grew up in the church. These are some stories that are almost iconic in nature. For example, last week we talked about the story of Noah's ark. And in particular, Noah's faithfulness, his willingness to do what God has commanded him to do, even though he might not understand all of it, and even though there's probably a fair amount of ridicule that came with him following after God's leading. That there's something about that story that still rings true and speaks to us in our lives today. And if you weren't here last weekend, I would encourage you, go online, go to our website, go to our YouTube channel, and watch the message from last week. Uh, This week, though, as we continue in uh, the, this series, we're going to look at another story, another famous story for a lot of us. It's the story where God parts the Red Sea. And here's the thing, what, no matter whether you are here last week or, or not, this is what I want you to understand throughout the series, that there is something in each of these stories that apply to us. There's something in these stories that shape and change how we live our lives today. They are more than a children's story. And so if you would like, as we journey with this story of the parting of the Red Sea, you can open up your Bibles. You can look at Exodus chapter 14. You can also follow along on the screen behind me or in the program. There's sermon notes if you want to take notes and follow along in there. Uh, As we join with this story, what's important for us to know is that um, God has been at work. And there has been some things that have happened in Egypt that caused Pharaoh, the leader, to decide to release God's people. Literally a series of plagues kind of fell upon Egypt, its land, its people, impacting and affecting so many. And it gets to the point where Pharaoh's like, I don't want these people anymore. Like these, I'm sorry, these Israelites, I don't want them in my land any longer. And Pharaoh decides to essentially release the Israelites to let them go, to, 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 to experience their freedom. And so Israel takes off. They start uh, following where God is leading. But after a short period of time, Pharaoh has a change of heart. Pharaoh's thinking, I, you know, okay, I, I don't know what I was doing. I just released uh, these people. I just released our slaves. These were the ones who, who did the hard labor in our land. Like, what was I thinking? And so Pharaoh decides, you know what? I'm going to actually send my army out after the people of Israel to capture them and bring them back to the land of Egypt. And so that's exactly what happens. The army of Pharaoh goes chasing after uh, the Israelites. At some point, the Israelites catch wind that the Egyptian army is coming for them. And it freaks them out. Like again, they think they're free, they have been released, that they're able to go and to pursue the promised land that God has marked out for them. And suddenly, the people who were their captors are now chasing them down. And the, and the, the text tells us in the story as we look in Exodus 14, that they begin to cry out, they begin to worry, they begin to question their leader Moses in the process. And this is what we read in chapter 14, beginning in verse 11. They said to Moses, why did you bring us out here in the wilderness to die? Uh, Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? This is like the, I told you so. I told you this was going to happen, Moses. We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves uh, to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. 
When the people of Israel see the army, they immediately play out the whole scenario in their mind. And they've come to the conclusion, we're dead. Like there's no getting through this. There's no way we're going to be able to defend ourselves. The Egyptian army is too strong. It would have just been better for us to be left in Egypt than it is for us to be slaughtered in the wilderness. Now Moses, he attempts to calm their fears. Uh, Moses attempts to speak maybe some hope and some wisdom in, in, into their lives in this moment, maybe in a way that changes their perspective. Perhaps in a way that causes them to see the situation a little bit differently than they currently see the situation. This is what Moses says beginning in verse 13. Moses tells the people, don't be afraid. He says, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you Just stay calm. Uh, Moses is like, there's nothing for you to worry about. more, More than that, not only is there nothing for you to worry about, there's nothing for you to do. Matter of fact, he tells the people, just stand still. Now, just think about this for a moment. And put yourself into the story. Like, how hard would those words be to hear. Like you are thinking you're free, you're pursuing the the place that God has marked out for you. Then suddenly you see this army, this vast army coming for you. You play out the whole scenario, like I said, we're gonna die, this is not gonna be good, it would be better for us to be slaves in Egypt than to be slaughtered in the wilderness. And now suddenly Moses is like, hey guys, don't worry. God's gonna fight for you. The only thing you need to do is stand still. Now those words go against the very natural fight or flight instinct that all of us have. The tendency in that moment would be either to pick up a weapon and prepare to do battle against the Egyptians or to take off and run. No one is thinking the best strategy right now is to stand still and not move. But that's what Moses tells the people to do. Moses says, just stand there and wait and watch to see how God is going to work. Now the truth is, the Israelites, they don't really have a place to run. Like even if they wanted to, they probably couldn't take off and run. They wouldn't get too far. They are likely backed up against the Sea of Galilee. The sea is in front of them. The army is behind them. Essentially, they have no place to go. Maybe you think, well, like, can't they just get some boats and, like, take boats across the sea, uh, uh, the Red Sea, and they just cross the Red Sea, then they'd be free, but the problem is they don't have boats. And so then what we do is we naturally, okay, well, if they can't, if they can't boat across the Red Sea, maybe they can swim across the Red Sea, just take off because they can just, they can swim across, they can get away from the Egyptian army. But here's the thing, uh, where it's believed it, they would have passed It is roughly at its narrowest between 12 and 20 miles wide. The point is even the best swimmers would struggle to just break out and swim 12 to 20 miles fully clothed. Like for them, this is a dead end. There is nowhere to go. They have to just stand still and see and wait and watch how God is going to work. And what we find out in this story very clearly is that God had a plan. God was about to do something powerful, something miraculous. God tells Moses this in verse 16. He says, pick up your staff and raise your hands over the sea, Dividing the, uh, divide the water so that the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And much like Noah, we talked about this last week, Moses does not seem to question. God's like, raise up your staff, raise your hands over the Red Sea, and it will just part so that Israel can walk on dry ground. Moses doesn't seem to question. I 
would, would do something entirely different, I believe. I'd be like, for real? Like, God, that's the plan? Like, you told us to stand still, but I thought you were going to, like, have us stand still, and we'd turn around, and we'd watch the Egyptian army in an instant all just fall and die. Like, that's what I'm expecting you to do. But you want me just, like, to hold my hands up over the Red Sea, and then, like, the waters are going to part, and then we're going to cross on dry ground? Like, that's the plan. All-powerful, mighty God. That's the plan. You could just wipe out this army, but this is what we're going to do. Now, maybe I'm just a faithless person. My guess is many of you would be in the same boat if you were in that place, but Moses wasn't. Moses did what God asked him to do, and that's what we see in verse 21. Then Moses raised his hands over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry ground. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. The the text tells us that God used the wind to separate the sea. That God used the wind to create a path for Israel to safely cross the Red Sea and get to Israel the other side. Now, now, miracle stories can be difficult for us to understand, difficult for us to wrap our minds around, so much so that we almost just kind of pass them off to the side. Oh, that's a cute children's story, but it's not a real story. It's not for real life today because it doesn't make sense. Could God really just part a sea? Is that even possible. And so because we have these questions, we, we, just, we just, again, we think, ah, you know, we'll just move on and, and, and just chalk that away as a nice little story. But I mentioned this last week, with so many miracle stories in Scripture, there is a significant amount of scientific evidence that backs up the probability and reality for an event like this happening. And I think that's what I want us to understand. Sometimes We think faith and science are in opposition of one another. But the truth is if God created the world and everything in it, he created scientific thinking. And he's not afraid of science. In so many ways, what happens in science only supports and backs up what we read about and see in Scripture. And I believe the story of the parting of the Red Sea is one of those situations. So as an example... The National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is based here in the United States, conducted a computer simulated event to try to see if they could reproduce the, 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 the circumstances and the, the situations that would have had to happen for a sea of the magnitude of the Red Sea to be parted by wind. And so what they did at this, at this research center is they said, that we're going to take the biblical account And we're going to put into our computer-generated model everything that is known in the biblical account. And then we're going to have to make some assumptions because it doesn't specify every bit. We're told, as an example, there is a wind that parts the sea, but what is the speed of the wind? What, what is the direction of the wind that it's coming in? And so what they looked at is they said, okay, well, we think 63 miles an hour, which seems like, why 63 miles an hour? They assumed a 63-mile-an-hour wind in their simulation for two reasons. One, at 63 miles an hour, an adult and a child could continue to walk in wind gusts that strong. Much beyond that, it might be okay for an adult to walk in those winds, but for a young child or an elderly person, it would be difficult for them to pursue forward in, in, in winds beyond 63 miles an hour. Another reason they chose 63 mile an hour winds is because that's what would need to have happened for a meteorological event known as a wind set down to take place. Now, I want us to understand here, 63 mile an hour winds are not like ridiculous. They're not like so out there, like we need a 575 mile an hour wind to move the waters. No, at 63 miles an hour, they believed, and their model showed, that it could launch a meteorological event known as a wind set down. And without getting into the scientific details of that, essentially what a wind set down is, is the wind presses its force on 
water in such a way that it displaces the water out of where it currently stands, creating dry ground underneath it. And this phenomenon is seen throughout history, completely apart from the biblical account. It shows us that there is a real scientific probability that there could be a pathway carved out for people to cross the Red Sea. Now the thing is, we don't know for certain if a wind set down is what happened. We don't know if there was a specific meteorological event in this moment that was aided by 63 mile an hour winds, so there would be just enough force to move the water, but not too much force to prevent people from walking. We don't know the specifics, but here's what I want us to to understand. It shows to me, and I would hope to you at least, that there is a reasonable probability, a scientific-backed reason, not that God needs a scientific-backed reason, but scientifically we could look at it and say, hey, it makes sense that this could have happened. It makes sense that what God said was going to happen could have actually happened. And as the text tells us, that's what does happen. Moses extends his hands, and the sea parts. And the people of God, the Israelites, they follow, they follow Moses. They follow the path that God had opened for them. God promised to protect his people. God said, hey, you just stand still. You just sit here and wait. I'm going to do the work. And that's what God did. And so the seas part. And this very act throws the Egyptian army into chaos. Again, they know the people of Israel. And and, and they've seen the way that their God, the God of all the universe, has acted on behalf. But how quickly we forget things. And so even in pursuit of the Israelites, they probably begin to think, oh, we're strong. We're powerful. We can take over this group of people. Yeah, we saw what their God did, but that that was then. This is now. And when they see the waters of the sea part, it throws the Egyptian army into chaos. And they recognize, not for the first time, I may add, add, but they recognize that God was fighting on behalf of Israel. We continue in verse 26. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, raise your hands over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back and cover the Egyptians and their chariots and their charioteers. So as the sun began to rise, Moses raised his hands over the sea and the waters rushed back into its usual place. The Egyptians tried to escape, but the Lord swept them into the sea. The the text tells us that when the people of Israel were safely across, that God would do his next act. That once again he would ask Moses to raise his hands, that the waters would fill back the dry land. And in the process, the Egyptian army, who was in hot pursuit, who was in chaos, was wiped out. They were swept out into the sea. And in this moment, it ensures that the people of Egypt, the army of Egypt, will never, ever be an issue for the Israelites again. That that path has closed. It's a reminder, it's a sign of God's profound strength and power. But it's also a reminder for the people of Israel that there is no going back. There is no returning. You're not just going to swim back the 12 to 20 miles. You're not just going to beg God to open up the sea so you can run back home. There is only moving forward. There is only trusting in the unknown of what God has marked out for these people. There is no going back to Egypt. And when the people, verse 31, when the people saw of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians. They were filled with awe before him. 
They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The text tells us that in this moment, they were moved. That in this moment, the people were filled with awe. They witnessed the power of God acting on their behalf, and their trust was completely in God. They were sold out. They were all in. Whatever God said to do, they would do, because they saw and they believed that God was as powerful as he claimed to be. Now, unfortunately, it didn't last for long. You just move forward a few chapters, and the text tells us when life got to be difficult, when the circumstances became uh, a struggle, when the unknown became maybe too um, present for them, too in front of them, they began to long to go back. Just like before, they cried out to Moses, can't we just go back to Egypt? Can't we once again just be slaves in Egypt? Like at least life was known there. Like we were at some level in charge a little bit there of our own lives. But this, it's just, God, it's just overwhelming. And it blows my mind how this repetitive pattern can play out. Like you are a slave in Egypt. And you see God through these plagues show up and move powerfully in such a way that Pharaoh's like, I'm done with you. Go. And so you head off, and then along the journey, you realize the army's coming after you. You're overcome with fear. You long to go back. But God says, no, no, no. Just stand still. Watch what I'm going to do. And then God moves. And God creates a way for you to cross the Red Sea. You cross the Red Sea. He wipes out the army in the sea. You are free once again. Like, God, we are fully on board with you. We trust you. And then you go just a few months later. And they're like, oh, we would just long to be back in Egypt. Life was better in Egypt. Being a slave was better than this. Can't we just go back? Now, it would be easy for us to look at the people of Israel and think, man, you guys got this all messed up. Like, yeah, if if God moved for me like God moved for you, then I would never question like you did. But here's the thing. We're just like them. We are just like the people of Israel. Like, no, we don't live in Egypt, but we do live in a foreign land. I mean, Scripture tells us that we are citizens of another kingdom, that we are not citizens of this earth, which means we have an allegiance to a good and better king, that we are called to have an allegiance to our king, King Jesus, that our lives center around his leading, that all that we do works to usher in his kingdom into the kingdom of this world, and we do this because we're not citizens here. We're citizens of another kingdom, and we know that, but we live in the tension of this reality where it's like, oh, but, but the world has an allure to it. There's some things I like about the world, uh, some things that I really enjoy about the world, and so we kind of get sucked into the world, and we start building the kingdoms of this world, and then we have these moments like, no, 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 I'm a follower of Jesus. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm building a different kingdom. And so we focus on that maybe for a season, but slowly we kind of get sucked back over into these these buildings of the kingdoms of this world and the promises and the pursuits. And we struggle and we war to go back and forth. And in that way, we're just like Israel. Like God has shown up. God has moved in our lives. God has changed and shaped our hearts. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you know that to be true. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I promise you, when you submit and surrender your life to Jesus, he will begin to shape and mold and change your heart. We know this reality to be true. But yet we're drawn to the false promises of something else. To the joys and the pleasures that might last for a moment but will never last for eternity. And so we focus and we build these kingdoms of the world, and we build these kingdoms, it pulls us farther and farther away from the kingdom of God. Uh, It's like this. I I have some ladders. I'm going to bring out these ladders on stage. I'm just going to use these ladders as an illustration. Please don't videotape what's about to happen, because if I fall, I don't want to end up on, on YouTube. That would be really bad. If I fall, I want someone to come help me, okay? Is our medical team in place today? 
We have a medical team in place. Okay. I'm going to be fine. Wow, that's maybe a little far. That's going to, yeah, we'll smooth these ladders. There we go. All right. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Rachel. All right. So we have two ladders. They are safe ladders. They are not lifted beyond the point where it says last locking position, danger, do not extend beyond this. So we're in a good position. Now, each of these ladders, they represent really two different things. And, and I'll just say for, for the sake of kind of uh, what we're looking at today, that this right here, as it lines up, this represents sort of the kingdom of God. Over here is kind of represent, re representative like the kingdoms of this world. And what happens inevitably is we kind of live in this place where we straddle the kingdom of God and the kingdom of, of, of this world. Right? And we kind of live in both of these places. But ultimately, in life, what happens is we're drawn one way or the other. And so as we get drawn closer to the kingdom of God, as we see ourselves as citizens in the kingdom of God, we work and we grow in our faith and we start to build up uh, the kingdom. We start to see that permeate and live out in our world today. And we continue to grow in our faith. But what happens over time is we start to get like, we get sucked back in. And we see the promises of the kingdom of the world and like we're, we know we should be here, but, but man, th those cars are really nice. Those houses are really nice. Those, again, not cars and houses aren't bad, but like the promises, the people, the lust, the addiction, right? Well, that's kind of fun for a moment, but like I'm, I'm here in the kingdom of God, but you know what? Like we'll kind of like just stretch out. Like if we can just rest our weight here, but just touch this, we can kind of live in both places. And then we climb a little bit higher in our faith, and of course, the tension and the stretch gets to be a little bit further. You know, we gotta really lean into this, but we still wanna be a part of it. Now this is maybe what we would like our lives to look like. The truth is, for most of us, we have focused our lives on building this kingdom, the kingdoms of this earth, building our kingdom, making sure we're in control, making sure we're safe, and we just keep climbing the ladder. And we get higher and higher. And we're like, oh, Sunday's coming. Okay. I'm at church. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm, God, I'm at church. No, no, this is a value for me. And then we climb a little higher. And we're like, no. Yeah, I can't reach that without, like, falling. And so we're like, okay, okay, that's maybe too far. But, like, okay, but I'm at church. And, like, but, God, I'm like, I'm going to be in a small group. And... God, I'm going to give. Don't fall. And you know what happens? We start to cling tighter and tighter to this. Because if I let go of this, it's all going to come crumbling down. And the truth is we can't live like this. We can't. We can't live in both worlds unless we accept such a small version of life that we're able to comfortably straddle both areas. And so we think, okay, well, this is good. This is good because I'm comfortable in either area. And I feel good enough about my faith. I feel good enough about my place in the world. If I climb too far here, then I, I don't know if I feel good about my faith. And if I climb too far up here, well, then I just, I, I, I fall behind the world. I, I can't keep up any longer. People are going to think I'm weird they're going to think I'm the person that's trying to build a, a, an ark out of nowhere. So I don't want that. I don't want to be weird. So I'll just like, you know, I'll, I'll be like a good Christian, like halfway up this ladder and halfway up the world's ladder. Here's a question I have for you. What version of life have you chosen? Look, be real honest with yourself right now. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to identify to everyone in this room. But I want to know what, which version of life have you chosen? Have you chosen to build your life in the kingdoms of this world? Have you longed for the promises and the allures of Egypt? I just want what the world has to offer. Have you chosen to, to build your life and the kingdom of God. 
And whatever God calls you to do, this is what you submit yourself to, even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if you don't understand it, even if you don't know what the natural next step is. Have you committed yourself to this life? Or have you committed yourself to the life where there's the lesser version, where you have a little bit of both, but you're still comfortable? What have you chosen? And my challenge for you would be, no matter what you've chosen in the past, to recognize right now in this moment, you can choose something different. And in case you're wondering what the right choice is, it's to build your life on this kingdom. It's to place your hope and your trust fully in God, to be willing to let go of the promises and the allures of this world. And guys, just like we see with Israel and just like we know in our life, it isn't easy. I think that's why John wrote these words in 1 John chapter 4. John would say this. He would say, uh, but you belong to God. Your life, you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. Who are those people? The false prophets of the world. You've won victory over the world, over those people of the world, the promises of the the world, the, the false and empty allures of the world. You have won victory over the world because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. the spirit inside of us is stronger than anything the world can offer us. God has marked out a path. God has paved the way. God has parted the sea. God has shown us what it looks like to follow after him. But you and I, we have to make that choice. You and I have to make the decision to trust God and to step and to walk the path. Being willing to leave this life behind. Even though almost daily we recognize it'll be a struggle because Satan works that way. Satan constantly tries to pull us back, pull us in, gets us to kind of divide our allegiance, to reach out to a life other than a life in God, a life in Christ. And so daily, we have to not only choose, but acknowledge that the power in us is greater than the power of this world. And that there's victory that has been won already because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And so my encouragement to you, my challenge to you, to me, to all of us, is to choose to build our lives on Jesus. To be willing to let go of this kingdom so that we might fully embrace and grab hold of the kingdom that we were meant to belong to from the very beginning. That this is where life is found. This is where freedom is found. This is the life that's been marked out for us. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for the story that we've just looked at. I thank you for the way that you moved powerfully to part a sea for your people to cross. But even in the midst of that, God, I can recognize in my life how I have a tendency to long to go back, just like Israel did. To long to go back to the way that life was, to long to go back even if it's a lesser version of life, than to step into and trust in the uncertainty to which you're leading me. And God, I know I'm not alone. It's a tension that we all live in, that we are citizens of the kingdom of God, but we are residents in the kingdoms of this world. And daily we will feel this constant struggle and pull. 
But in those moments, may we be different than the people of Israel. In those moments, may we recognize that there's truth in your word, that victory has been won, that the battle has been won, that we have been set free, and that what lives in us, the Spirit's power that's in us, is greater than the promises of this world. Help us be people who build and anchor our lives on you, who trust in you completely, who follow the path that you lead us on. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in
lift your voice. Oh, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. That's just who, that's who God is. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. And I pray that you would trust that to be true for you in your life. To trust in God. And to believe in all of your being that the life he has marked out for you is better than any life you could ever possibly build. I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. And I want to just take a quick second to talk to those people who are newer here to Lake Sawyer Church. Maybe this is even your first time with us. Uh, we recognize that it can be overwhelming to step into church, maybe for the first time or perhaps the first time in a long time. And with it comes questions and you wonder, like, what's this place all about? Like, there seems to be a lot of people here. How do I get to know people? Really what we've done is we've tried to compile what we see to be the, the most common questions that people ask, really the five most common questions, and I answer them in five minutes or less. But more importantly, it's an opportunity for you to an ask any questions that you might have. And it's called Five and Five, that, uh, that uh, environment, and it happens right after our services here in just a moment, off to my left and your right. Again, if you are new here, first time, or you've been here a handful of times and haven't stopped by Five and Five, We'd love for, uh, for you to come over there. I'd love an opportunity to get to meet you. I also want to invite you back next week as we continue in our series, More Than a Children's Story. My hope is that you're, you're starting to realize that there is value in these stories and that there's something God wants you and me to learn in these stories. And I can't wait for next week to see, God, what is that going to be for us? So I look forward to hopefully seeing you back next week. Have an amazing Sunday. Enjoy the sunshine, and we'll see you soon. God bless.